Welcome to Follow the Data. I'm your host, Catherine Oliver. Imagine a lawless frontier. It probably wouldn't be so different from the ocean, where abuses like slavery and human trafficking or crimes like rape or murder are hidden from sight. Ian Urbina is a journalist focusing on lawlessness at sea. He has investigated how Chinese fishing vessels are illegally operating in the waters between Korea, Japan, and Russia, violating UN sanctions, and recently, how the food security of coastal populations in West Africa is at risk due to overfishing. After reporting on staff at the New York Times for about 20 years, he started the Outlaw Ocean Project, a nonprofit journalism organization which focuses on telling stories about the environmental, human rights, and labor abuses occurring offshore around the world. In order to reach a broader audience, Ian has also launched the Outlaw Ocean Music Project, which allows artists to create music inspired from journalism on ocean issues. As a result, hundreds of musicians from more than 80 countries have been telling new audiences about issues at sea. On this episode, Ian joins Melissa Wright, who oversees the Vibrant Oceans Initiative, Bloomberg Philanthropy's program that works to protect the ocean and those who depend on it from climate change, pollution, and overfishing. Melissa and Ian will tell us more about how reporting at sea has changed during the COVID-19 pandemic, how his team uses data from Global Fishing Watch to corroborate his work, and how you can take action to protect our ocean at home. Thank you for tuning in today. I'm Melissa Wright with Bloomberg Philanthropy's Climate and Environment Team, and I lead our Vibrant Oceans Initiative. Our Vibrant Oceans Initiative works to protect and restore the ocean by promoting conservation, protecting coral reef habitats, and reducing harmful and illegal overfishing practices. I'm so thrilled to be joined today by Ian Urbina, a Pulitzer Prize winning investigative reporter whose stories have appeared in outlets like The New Yorker, The New York Times, and the BBC. He's also an author who's spent many years telling the incredible story of our ocean and the people that depend on it. Thanks for being here, Ian. Thank you for having me. Ian, you've been reporting on the ocean, as I said, for many years, and you've recently launched a journalism nonprofit to continue this work. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about your organization, the Outlaw Ocean Project? So after being on staff at the Times for about 20 years, I decided I would try something new, and um, I created a nonprofit, which is very small. It's me and a team of four others. And its mission is to produce long form narrative investigative stories about the human rights, labor and environmental abuses that occur at sea around the world. And then to take that reporting and place it in kind of tier one news outlets around the world and also translate it into other languages and and get it to run in more non-English venues as well. That is really inspiring. I love to hear about how you have taken this interest of yours and just pushed it forward and now um, have rolled out your own enterprise here with the Outlaw Ocean Project. What inspired you to report on the ocean? Before becoming a journalist, I was a cultural anthropologist and I had spent some time uh, on ships and around seafarers and just became fascinated by them, you know, uh, almost anthropologically as this diaspora transient tribe, if you will, of largely invisible workers that are out in a space beyond the horizon that happens to cover two thirds of the planet. And so essential in ways that you, Melissa, know well, but, you know, producing 50% of our oxygen and sort of the temperature stabilizer of the planet and a source of protein for much of the globe and a, a throughway across which 90% of commerce, you know, sends its goods. Um, So in so many ways, it was a vital space, but one that you rarely heard about or heard from in mainstream media. And I thought, okay, well, what if we went out there and, you know, took the reader vicariously out with us and told stories about the people and the priorities and concerns that exist out in this space so that, you know, ultimately we could stoke a sense of, urgency and and also um, empower, you know, create a sense of fluency about the ocean that I didn't think existed prior. What has been 
the most interesting or exciting or terrifying moment for you during your time as a, a reporter on these issues? It was certainly terrifying to leave a salaried job at a state institution, you know, with a kid heading to college and, and sort of branch off out on my own, you know, and this is a moment to thank Bloomberg Philanthropies for making that leap possible. But in the reporting itself, I'd say scary wise, um, a photographer and I reported about illegal fishing and, and, and sort of industrial fishing occurring near Somalia. And we went to a, a state in Somalia, which is um, especially lawless Putin land. And, and we ended up getting stuck there um, and lost our protection and sort of fell out of favor with the government and, and we're really in a, in a bad place. So that was a fairly scary experience. At sea, you know, we um, reported on a, the geopolitical and complicated ways that countries at, sh- at sea don't agree where the borders are, you know, in ways that are different than on land and the, how that feeds into overfishing and illegal fishing. And in this case, we were on a patrol on an Indonesian fisheries vessel. Uh, and in what we thought, or at least I thought was Indonesian water, and I've been told by the Indonesians it was their water, uh, when along came, you know, a huge Vietnamese uh, Navy vessel and a very tense standoff uh, occurred where each side took hostages from the other and it looked like we were going to possibly get boarded by these other officers. That, that was also pretty scary. I'm in a bit of stunned silence. I can't imagine living through something like that and continuing to do this work. Major kudos to you for um, taking this on and making it your life's work. How has your reporting changed during the last year, during the COVID pandemic? Well, I mean, new issues emerged, right? You know, so there's this sort of, um, there are the acute crimes and acute abuses, so sea slavery and murder and, you know, uh, rape at sea and these sorts of things. And then there are the chronic kind of slow motion uh, crimes, uh, abandonment of seafarers or dumping of oil at sea. Um, the, the problem of, of these workers on these fishing vessels getting abandoned and sort of cut loose uh, was put on steroids with COVID. So there are, you know, tens of thousands of um, crews around the world that these are largely workers from uh, the global south, developing nations that don't have the the means to just muster some from their savings and catch a flight home. It's it's far from that simple. Um, so COVID really um, raised the urgency of that issue for me personally and for my team. Obviously, travel became super difficult, and for a good five months we couldn't go anywhere. Uh, but then we started getting back out there and reporting. It meant that there was a greater level of risk. We had to quarantine on the front end and the tail end, and and some stories were just super difficult to to access because we couldn't get into the countries. They weren't letting anyone in. Uh, but things are opening up now, and 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 again, we've been um, out there. Just got back from a story in Mexico, and before that was um, doing a story on the Mediterranean off the coast of Italy, um, and so headed next month to Libya and Tunisia. And so you know things are really picking back up. And in the midst of all of this, you have been focused on another uh, interesting endeavor. Um, So in addition to your traditional reporting, Outlaw Ocean's launched the Outlaw Ocean Music Project, which uses your reporting and sound archive to raise awareness around the human rights, labor and environmental abuses that have occurred at sea. What got you started on this project? It's it's a child of many parents, truth be told, you know, um, that goes back quite some time. I mean, in its earliest form, it was just this sort of um, seed of an idea that, you know, as an avid consumer of music my whole life, there was this capability in that medium to capture and convey emotions in ways and to an extent that still photography, video, and especially the written word couldn't. And that X factor, that kind of missing ingredient as a writer, if you're trying to really capture the urgency, the desperation, the poignancy, the pathos of a certain moment, you know, of a certain topic, those emotions are really valuable currency that that I could never really get to. And maybe a better writer could better than I could. So I just thought like music, you know, really gets at you through a different orifice, if you will, rather than taking it in through your eyes, the written word through your eyes, you're you're taking in the experience through your ears and and it sort of evokes emotion. And so I thought 
wouldn't it be neat? And also as a longtime fan of Lin-Manuel Miranda and Hamilton and a devotee of, of hip hop, I thought, wouldn't it be neat if we could um, recruit musicians, be they classical or electronic or hip hop or what have you, present them respectfully with the, the reporting, invite them to take a look at it. If it inspired them, ask them to make an album in their own style, use some of the sounds from the reporting and then hand it back to us. We publish the music and it allows us to sort of take the journalism a, out to a different demographic of consumer, you know, not the New Yorker, the New York Times reader, but rather to like my 17 year old son who consumes a lot of information through YouTube and Spotify. And um, we could get at that demographic internationally more effectively. Um, and so that's what we did. And now we have, you know, 500 musicians from 80 countries making albums. And it just sort of is a carrier for, um, for these stories to, to a different audience. Tell me a little bit more about some of these artists. Who are they? Uh, where are they coming from? What are some of your, your latest faves? Yeah, I mean, in the beginning, I wanted to recruit rappers, you know, just because I listen to a lot of hip hop. Um, the price point of recruiting was tough. I just it didn't work out. So then I pivoted to electronic because it's a lot of folks who are working with a Mac computer in their basement. And they're also very used to working with external, you know, found sound and samples. And so I'd bring them, you know, the, the textured stuff that came from the reporting, the sound archive, machine gun fire in Somalia or chanting Cambodian deckhands in the South China Sea. And then once we sort of figured out how to do this whole thing, the digital music thing, we began diversifying and reaching out more towards classical and jazz and ambient and sort of more melodic artists. And... Now we're doing a lot more, um, you know, sort of uh, piano and, and, and violin soloists and, um, and then traditional folk musicians, uh, some of whom don't use any of the Sound Archive uh, materials, but just sort of read the book and, and to some degree get inspired by things within it. And then they make music around it and then we pair it with videos. So uh, it's been a shifting thing. And then this year, you know, we're now trying to pivot more towards the global south and recruit artists from smaller island nations and coastal nations and developing nations where we can potentially put those artists on a global stage by association with the project but we could also get better access to their local audiences you know be it in Kiribati or Fiji or 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 Kenya and Ghana you know um, and um, really take this reporting into those consumers Last summer, you wrote a story discussing how China has one of the world's worst scores when it comes to illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing. How does illegal fishing impact those local communities that you're just talking about and the fishers? How are they seeing you know, the, the changes in the, their day to day lives due to some of the problems and issues that you're reporting on? Yeah, I mean, so. They're global issues, they're transnational issues, you know, but the concerns about overfishing and illegal fishing are super local in a variety of ways. So we did a story, for example, with NBC News about squid boats and about North Korean squid fishermen, very poor, small, wooden boats that were routinely washing up with dead bodies on them, dead North Korean fishermen on them. And th these boats were washed, these ghost boats is what they're called, were washing up uh, on, on Japanese shores. And there was a real mystery as to why that was going on. There was also a mystery as to why the squid stock um, in that body of water, why it had seen this huge drop off in the squid stock, 70% drop off. Working with Global Fishing Watch, we were able to figure out that there was this invisible and illegal, indeed the, the largest illegal fishing fleet ever discovered in North Korean waters, and it was all Chinese industrial fishing boats. And so um, we went and reported on that story, revealed it. And, and again, that has international and geopolitical consequences because there you have UN sanctions forbidding any foreign fleets from being in North Korean waters. And on the other hand, it has a very local level um, impacts because you have South Koreans, North Koreans, Japanese, Russian, all with local artisanal fishing communities that rely for their main source of protein and main source of income on the, the near shore stocks that are getting raked clean by this huge, illegal, largely invisible industrial fleet. 
and and you even have the presence of the industrial fleet causing North Koreans to go too far from shore, take desperate you know means, and end up breaking down and and getting washed up on Japanese shores. So you have human rights, you have labor, you have environment, you have all these concerns tied up all in one big topic of illegal fishing. For those that have not become familiar yet with Global Fishing Watch, could you tell us a little bit more about how you use the data and the analyses that were embedded in that tool for your reporting to reveal some of these horrific offenses? Yeah, so Global Fishing Watch is a really inspiring and interesting group. Uh, it's a nonprofit that sort of specializes in ocean issues generally and sort of promote transparency and accountability and governance at sea. Uh, but their specialty is big data and satellites and tr- trying to make uh, the seas more seeable, if you will, or trackable. And so in, in the case of our collaboration, Global Fishing Watch had already done a yeoman's work with a team of international academics, South Korean, uh, Japanese, American, I think Australian as well. Um, and they had figured out how to use a different sort of satellite. So the, the illegal fishing fleet from China that was in North Korean waters, those boats were turning off their transponders. So they were invisible through the traditional means of tracking maritime traffic. However, what Global Fishing Watch and the academics did is they resorted to a couple of other different types of satellites that can you know, track radio transmissions, um, keep track of, of boats that are using really bright light bulbs, uh, such as squid boats often do, so as to track the squid closer to the surface, and, and sort of use these scrappy other grids of information to lay eyes on um, who's in those waters and, and whose boats are those and how many are they and when are they arriving. And so they had done that from a data perspective already. And then they brought the Yellow Ocean Project in and said, look, we'd like you to handle this um, journalistically. We've got the data now. We can corroborate the anecdotal evidence that has been coming out of the region for a long time, eyeball you know, verification of lots of ships over there. And um, so I took a team, bought our way onto a South Korean squid vessel, headed up to North Korean waters, and then sort of waited at these key coordinates where the data seemed to indicate if the Chinese were going to come through South Korean waters and enter North Korean waters, we would likely see them in that general area. And lo and behold, there they were, you know, these, these uh, uh, you know, row of dozen ships, single file, all not transponding, so all dark, all invisible. And um, we followed that um, cluster of ships as they went all the way into North Korean waters just as a way of ground truthing, if you will, what the data seemed to indicate. And then also capturing it all on video. And and we followed them for a while until um, the lead ship in that convoy uh, came at us and made aggressive moves indicating that he was not thrilled that we were filming and following. And so we peeled off and went back to shore. And, and that was a key part, again, you know, that... Global Fishing Watch could have done and, 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 and did a peer-reviewed journal article on their data. But in terms of driving social change and getting the public to care, um, the journalism side of, of that was important. And uh, that's why it was sort of a successful collaboration. Really compelling. And uh, thank you for being a soldier in this fight. It's really honorable work that you're doing. It's not everyone who would uh, set out to to pick fights with fleets like that. So one of the brilliant things I would say about um, the transparency movement, the transparency at sea movement is that it not only identifies potentially illegal uh, fishers at sea, um, but allows us to identify those who are fishing legally as well. But there are obviously still major problems even with legal fishing. And I, I want to come to a story that you wrote recently around the pretty troubling paradox that aquaculture fuels. So although the demand for fish has doubled since the 60s, by farming the fish we're eating most around the world, we're draining the stock of many others, which communities in West Africa and other regions rely on, um, basically threatening the food security in the region. Tell us about that paradox uh, and what are your insights having done this reporting there? So to start at the most basic level is to point out that, you know, 25 years or so ago, uh, scientists realized that the oceans were running out of fish and stocks around the world were collapsing. And 
um, a big driver of that problem was industrial fishing. And we were just pulling too many fish out of the seas. Um, and so a desire to slow the rate of ocean depletion gave rise to or incentive for onshore fish farms, aquaculture, it's called. So these are often either onshore, huge pools of water, almost like massive earthen swimming pools where you raise stock um, of whatever, shrimp, salmon, what have you know, or they're near shore um, fish farms where they're penned, gigantic pens and the fish are kept there. So this is aquaculture. And this was initially meant to be a way to slow the rate of wild capture, wild caught fish, ocean depletion, right? The problem that emerged was a problem you see with big agriculture. You know, when you start penning large groups of animals, be they chicken, pigs, cattle, or fish, you have to deal with lots of issues. Their waste product and disposal of them, their emissions, disease, because you're putting too many in a close quarters and they start catching diseases. So you feed them antibiotics to keep them healthy. And also the market drive to fatten them up faster so that you can get them, whatever the animal is, to market faster and make more money on them. And so we began more and more using fish meal. And fish meal is basically fish you catch at sea, you grind up, and you pelletize into these high protein pellet sources or oil that you can put in the water and the fish eat it. And, um, you know, it gets them bigger faster. This was the core dark irony of this reporting in that now fish meal, you know, and well, aquaculture now provides 50% of the seafood that ends up on plates and feeding those fish is predominantly fish meal led. And so you have massive quantities of wild caught fish being pulled from the ocean to feed on land fish. And so the very solution that was meant to slow ocean depletion is speeding it up. And that was the core problem that we found in Gambia, you know, West African, tiny West African nation, where the local folk had for decades, if not centuries, depended on this one very abundant type of fish called the bonga fish. And this was so cheap that you could get it for free at the market only two decades ago. And then a bunch of fish meal factories moved in to Mauritania, Senegal, and Gambia, 14 to be exact, all Chinese owned. And all of a sudden these industrial boats came into the near shore waters, scooping up all the bonga fish, grinding them up in the factory, pelletizing, selling to EU, Chinese, Norwegian, American fish meal um, uh, companies, those pellets get tossed into the, the fish meal, uh, into the uh, fish farm uh, that produce the fish that, you know, the Western world eats. So you had a destabilizing food security issue as well unfolding in the coast of West Africa where the locals could no longer get their hands on the, on the fish that they had always relied on. These stories reveal to us the interconnectedness of so many different issues. Uh, living through the last year, that has been brought home to many of us in a way that uh, we've never felt before through the COVID pandemic. And being able to translate how we're experiencing these global impacts and, and the insecurity that we are feeling economically it's a hard time to bear um, uh, these kinds of issues as we're planning for how to get back to normal, as we say. How can people during this Earth Month, you know, be thinking about potential solutions or changes in their own lives um, or things they should be asking their lawmakers, their decision makers to do uh, in order to protect the oceans against the dangers of illegal fishing and to support those communities that we're hearing about in your reporting? Yeah, no, I think it's a really good and timely question. I mean, to, to, to sort of take one step back is to reiterate the point you make. Like, I don't know that we've ever, we as the reading, consuming Western public, if you will, um, have ever been as acutely aware of the globalized reality we've created, right? You look at what happened in the Suez Canal, you look at how COVID caused these backups of cargo ships in the LA port, you look at how, you know, this global pandemic spread uh, to everyone so quickly, and you realize that we are 
all very, very connected. And a lot of the thing that connects us is this globalized supply chain, you know, whether it's for Nike shoes or shrimp, you know, and that is um, something that I think we sort of ignored for a couple of decades. And well, I, first thing I would always say is first think of yourself in a bunch of different ways. You're a taxpayer, you're uh, an interlocutor, you have partners, you have kids, you have spouses, what have you, you have other people that you talk to routinely, you're a consumer of news, you're a, you're a donor of sorts, you give small amounts to or causes you care about, you're a buyer of stuff. And so just in those capacities, all of us are all of those things, you have lots of different ways in which you can do small things that in small ways perhaps help lessen your complicity in abuses and crimes, right? So as a buyer of stuff, well, first of all, I'd say, you know, and this isn't self-serving, you know, promoting my own endeavor of journalism, but it is key to not forget that unless we constantly are aware of and constantly increasing our fluency about these issues, we won't really have the ability to know what are smart organizations to support and things to buy and that sort of stuff. So journalism matters, you know, good journalism, rigorous journalism really matters. And supporting that, especially as the costly international investigative long form journalism gets defunded by major institutions, that's really important to bear in mind, especially when it comes to the oceans, because it's out of sight, out of mind, beyond the horizon. You know, it's easy to forget and ignore. And it's 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 very common that papers are not you know, sending reporters out into this space. Um, but then, you know, your, your lawmakers uh, are the decision makers of policy and sort of thinking about what are things that you care a lot about um, uh, in the ocean space, getting somewhat informed and then looking at who you're voting for and where they stand, if they stand anywhere on these issues, that that matters, you know, because they, being politicians and policymakers, adjust where they stand based on what they're hearing, you know, from people on the kinds of questions they're getting and asking the right questions. And, and then, you know, um, buying practices starts with looking at, okay, where is there good information out there? If you want to eat seafood, uh, you know, one option is to stop eating seafood, right? Stop eating meat and switch to a plant-based diet. If you don't want to do that and you do want to keep eating seafood, then you can start thinking, okay, well, how can I um, try to not buy things that have a higher risk quotient for sea slavery or dumping or illegal fishing? And there, you know, Monterey Bay Aquarium, there are other good organizations out there that try to provide consumers with more informed decision-making. Uh, and then supporting organizations, not just journalism, but, you know, Global Fishing Watch and, and these sorts of organizations that are out there that um, are doing really important work to focus on better governance of the oceans, um, uh, you know, and, and supporting them with time or finances um, is another thing that average folk can do. Great. To cap off our conversation on a, a positive note, and I love hearing all of your ideas, I can take a few of those notes and, and apply them to my own life um, tomorrow. Um, what's giving you hope right now? Where do you see the most opportunity for change? I mean, um, well, aside from the vaccine, <laughs> um, uh, but in the specific ocean space, um, I, I, I'm hopeful because there are more folks having this kind of conversation. You know, the, um, the fluency among editors even in my own profession and the interest level by news outlets to run these stories has grown significantly in three years. You know, um, I don't have to explain things. Uh, so that that is really great news for the movement, if you will. Um, I talk with students and, you know, and lawyers and, you know, um, just average folk and they seem to be, I don't know where they get their information, but they seem to be much more conscious of the way, for example, that the climate crisis factors into um, overfishing or sea slavery or um, dumping of oil. You know, five years ago when I said that coral decimation is a climate change problem and talked about how our addiction to fossil fuels is really dr driving um, a lot of these other concerns, I got kind of blank stares. Now I don't. Uh, so I, I think um, I'm really inspired by just how many people are talking about the issue uh, now compared to before. And after this podcast lands, uh, we'll have even more people <laughs> uh, clamoring to know more. So I appreciate the time, Ian. 
And uh, thank you so much for all of these fascinating and, and pretty sobering insights. Thanks for all the work that you're doing to safeguard the ocean and shining light on these global systems that exploit it. I really admire everything that you're doing. It was such a pleasure to talk with you and I look forward to reading your next story. Thank you so much. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Follow the Data. Many thanks to Melissa Wright and Ian Urbina for joining us. You can listen to the Outlaw Ocean Project's work at www.theoutlawocean.com. If you haven't already, please be sure to subscribe to Follow the Data. This episode was created by Amy June, Sarah Washington Gogan, Marshall Cohen, Daphne Wang, Phoebe Song, Pauline Vascu, Devin Alessio, Allison Crone, China Fry, Charlotte Norsworthy, and Sarah Patterson. As our founder, Mike Bloomberg, says, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So until next time, keep following the data. I'm Catherine Oliver.